Welcome back again. I often have to remind myself that there are two very distinct faces of the U.S. in Iraq. The military, of course, but then there's the less visible second force of thousands of U.S. administrators and advisors who, at least initially, wielded the most power. We don't see much of them, nor do Iraqis, for they live inside the heavily guarded, lavish, and relatively safe green zone of Baghdad. It's a bizarre existence which seems to have little to do with the reality of Iraq, and that's a big part of the problem. It's a fantasy world just portrayed in a remarkable new book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, by Rajiv Chandrasekharan. Chandrasekharan was an outstanding reporter in Iraq for a year and a half, before returning to the Washington Post, where he is now assistant managing editor. Rajiv Chandrasekharan, thank you for joining us. In the opening lines of your book, there's some fascinating scenes where Americans could actually live for months on end without ever having in the green zone to taste Iraqi food, without ever hearing the chanting of Muslim prayer, without ever really feeling they're in a foreign country. I mean, how disconnecting did this feeling? You know, the green zone took on this otherworldly quality. It was a place uh, where they, they filled up the swimming pools with water, there were bars, there was a disco, everybody drove around in brand new Chevrolet Suburbans, those big sport utility vehicles. There were, uh, there was ample other recreational opportunities. There were Bible study classes, salsa dancing lessons, gymnasiums. Inside the green zone, there was 24 hour a day electricity. On the outside, many Baghdadis were lucky to get four or six hours of power a day. You know, on the inside, there was always air conditioning in the conference rooms. On the outside, people sweltered in the heat. Uh, so, you know, you had this, th this sort of otherworldly nature inside, and it resulted in well-meaning Americans coming up with sort of policies that were just unnecessary. It led to this, this sort of almost sort of surreal set of policies that were promulgated by the occupation authority. You know, you had economists who showed up in a country with 40 percent unemployment and said, you know, what this place needs isn't more jobs, isn't basic reconstruction projects. We should rewrite the tax code. And they went through it and rewrote it line by line. They gave them a dream of the neoconservatives in America, a 15 percent flat tax. And to me that, you know, these things were able to happen because inside the green zone, everything seemed to be normal. Iraq seemed to be a country on the move, you know. Stability was just around the corner. And at the center of this great imperial court is this proconsul, Paul Bremer III, who seems a man of extraordinary arrogance and naivety, you know, all rolled into one, who more than anybody doesn't seem to get what's going on to the point where he he disbands the army of almost 400,000 men, thus creating an immediate unemployment pool of people trained with arms, and launches a debathicization campaign against the governing party, which includes throwing thousands of teachers out of work. I mean, how could he have been so misguided? Well, Bremer was not a Middle East expert. He wasn't a real post-conflict specialist. I think he came in there sharing the view of many in senior levels of the Bush administration that Iraq was going to be a quiescent terrarium for neoconservative policies. And, uh, you know, we vanquished their army in three weeks. And so there was this view in some circles, including the circles that include the White House and the Pentagon, uh, that uh, Iraq would be, would be stable. Iraq would be a place where they could build uh, a free market. They could build a, a democratic government that would be a beacon of change across the Middle East. And so when Bremer came in, you know, he, he got caught up in that, that view of the world and I think felt that if he was going to sort of make Iraq into that shining city on a hill, well, by golly, they had to have a brand new professional army. They needed a, you know, all the bad guys uh, out of the government. They needed to engage in a degree of sort of social engineering and economic transformation that would be unparalleled. Well, perhaps you can do that if you're dealing with a country that, that believes it's a vanquished nation in need or ha that has no choice but to submit to foreign occupation. And perhaps you can do that if you have hundreds of thousands of occupation forces to keep the order. But the Americans had neither. And so Bremer's plans, his political plans, his economic plans, his reconstruction plans were fundamentally unsustainable 
in post-Saddam Iraq. Did the military, we're talking about civilian commanders now, did those military commanders have a, a slightly more realistic view of the challenge? They certainly did because the military, by and large, was outside the green zone. They were out in the provinces. They were in the cities and towns. Their young men and women were running patrols through cities some cases getting shot at, but it was military officers who were talking to local tribal sheikhs and local mayors and imams and, and others. And they were picking up the political, social, religious, cultural forces at play on the ground. And they believed that reconstruction needed to be speeded up, that it needed to be small scale and sustainable, that Iraqis needed to be more involved in their governance. Yet when they went to the green zone and tried to to, to explain these things to the civilians who were in charge, to Ambassador Bremer and his team, those military officers were largely disregarded. You know the Iraqi people very well and spent a lot of time there at a, at a very traumatic period. Do you think the kind of mistakes made, uh, which are largely agreed on almost by everybody except the 10, 20 percent who can see no error, can those mistakes be reversible? Are they reversible, or do you think, in fact, this period of imperial rule so poisoned the well that there, there's no coming back from that disaster? I, I think it may well be too little, too late. Um, a number of policies that were pursued back in 2003, had they been reversed or different policies pursued way back then, I think the chances of success would have been far greater. I think that if, if we'd quickly moved to accommodate many former mid-level Ba'athists, people without blood on their hands, people who were not cronies of Saddam, and found jobs for them in the government, for instance, I think you could have prevented some of those people from becoming insurgents or turning against uh, the coalition forces. Well, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, uh, your book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City is absolutely fascinating, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And that's our show from Washington, the first of a series of foreign trips for our world this winter. Please drop us your thoughts and suggestions at ourworld.cbc.ca. I'm Brian Stewart. Thanks for watching, and please join us next week.